push this before preacher Daryl gets on me. Starting at verse 13 of 1 Samuel 23. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbore to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought to kill him every day. But God delivered him not unto his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph, in a wood. Doesn't seem like much, does it? But let's look at the way God's shelter... Remember he promised us food, shelter, and raiment, didn't he? And we're going to look a little bit at the shelter. And when I say shelter, right away we think of our homes. But God has other ways of sheltering us, of protecting us, and keeping us safe. And along with that, it's what we call God's divine providence. Now what is providence? First of all, why don't we understand what the word providence is before we... Oh, I think I know what that means. It's God's foresight. His timely care, His knowing what is necessary for future use in our lives. And believe me, He knows exactly what we're going to need 10 years now, 20 years from now. Amen. God knows that already ahead of time. It's His divine providence. He had done some things for David that we just can't help but see in God's Word and they jump out at you if you pay attention to them. How awesome... He watched, he just did so many things for David. There's so many things. He protected this young lad. Let's see how, how, how David's life has fallen into where he's at today in this text of Scripture. He seemed to have everything going for him in his life, didn't he? As a young boy, he was attacked by a lion and he defeated it. He was attacked by a bear, and he, and he beat the bear. And then he shows up and fights a giant, and defeats the giant, and becomes a hero. All of Israel loves David. Why, he's the greatest guy in the world. He's not afraid of anything. The king even loves him so much, he says, why don't you come and move into the palace? Play your harp for me and soothe me. Everything's going his way, isn't it? Even here we see that David just fought a battle. David, every battle that David fought, he was victorious. Did you know that? Every battle that he's fought up to this point, he's won. God is on his side. Israel's fallen in love with this man. But suddenly King Saul doesn't like him that much anymore, does he? You know, King Saul didn't like that the people of Israel were treating David so good. He started getting a little bit. He started getting a little bit jealous, didn't he? Yeah. And we have we ever seen that in our lives when we know people that have maybe Amen. gotten somewhere a little bit better. Right. Yeah. And suddenly somebody's a little upset. Well, they don't deserve that, or I should have got that position. That's not fair. And they start treating that person bad because yeah. they bettered themselves. Saul got quite angry. He got so angry and Satan worked on him so much that he said, just kill him. And that's all that was on Saul's mind. I've got to kill David. i got to kill David. i got to get rid of this guy. He's ruining what I've built up here. The problem, David had no option where we're looking at here but to run. He had to hide from Saul. David's only got an army of 600 men. Saul's probably got that beat quite well. But you know, that wasn't in David's blood, was it? It wasn't in David's blood to run. Whatever happened in David's life, he was ready to stand for the Lord. He stood out in the battlefield and he said, I come at you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The God 
of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the way David fought battles. He stood firm. Running from King Saul just didn't cross his mind. It probably really bothered him that he had to turn and flee, but God was trying to teach him a lesson here tonight, or, or, and us tonight. But sometimes we need to put aside what we think is right yeah. Yeah. and do what God's telling us to do. Amen. And David was learning that here in these verses. I know as much as he wanted to fight, God was telling him, I've got a place prepared for you. I want you to go over in the wilderness of Zip and hide. And I'll take care of protecting you. You see, God had plans for David, didn't he? He was the next king. And when God has plans for you, he's going to take care of you. And he's going to protect you. And that's the same thing in our Christian lives. If you're a child of his tonight, nothing's going to harm you that he doesn't know about. He's going to prepare you for everything that comes your way in life. We need to allow God to guide our lives. There's two words, and I actually, out of those three verses, there's two words, and they're found in the 14th verse. And there's two words I want to study on tonight. It said, David abode in the wilderness. I want to look at that word wilderness. And then it says in strongholds. I want to look at the word strongholds. Alright, if you're going to get technical on me, that's two words. Okay. I want to look at those words tonight. It says David abode in the wilderness. God sent David into a wilderness to hide from King Saul. Him and 600 men. Now the Greek word for wilderness is called Eremus. That's the Greek word for wilderness. And it means a desolate and lonely place. A desolate and lonely place. That's what it means in the Greek text. It doesn't sound like the place that God would send David so he could hide him, does it? A desolate and lonely place. But that's exactly what God told him to do. He said, I prepared a place for you long ago in the wilderness of Zip. Go over there and hide. It's a mountainous area, probably had a lot of trees and a lot of caves. He said, you and your men go hide over there. King Saul can search for you as long as he wants to and I'll never let him find you. Now you stop and think about today. Are we not in the wilderness when we walk outside the door of this church? In the world that we have to live in outside of this church and outside of our homes is a wilderness, isn't it? It's full of all kinds of things that we don't want to have enter into our church or enter into our home. It's not wrong that you can walk out of here and find any kind of sin that you want out in that wilderness. But yet that's where God chose to send David and his men. In the wilderness. And that's where he chooses for us to be. In the wilderness. Amen. We need to be out there because that's where we can be most effective for him. Well, it may not be a pleasant place to go to. It may not be some place that you want to raise your children. But that's where we have to live. Because once you're a child of God that says this world is not our home. Amen. This is just a temporary place and we have to live in this sinful place until our time is through. But God makes it possible for us to survive in that wilderness. Just like he made it possible for David to survive in his wilderness. You know, the real problem that comes into our wilderness is that we become too accustomed to that wilderness. Each and every one of us has allowed something in that wilderness to, to enter into our homes. Sometimes we let it enter into our churches. Yep. And then we have to pay for it. It may be something real subtle. You may, it, maybe you have teenagers and they bring home a movie. It doesn't seem like it's that bad of a movie. But then the next thing you know, 
they got some friends come over and they watch it and there's something in there that really shouldn't be in there. We've allowed that into our homes. Maybe it's some music that the young people listen to. I'm sure if you ask my mom and dad years ago, they thought I was crazy with the stuff I listened to. But if you really listen to some of the music our children are bringing home today, some of this rap music and some of this stuff that just every other word is not appropriate to be in my home, but we've allowed it to sneak in. And we've accepted that. We've made ourselves too comfortable in the wilderness. We've made our home so comfortable that maybe we don't even want one. When God calls us to go home, hey, I want to leave. I like it here. I like my house. It's got all the comforts I need. We've made ourselves that way to where everything's so easy. Our telephone is right next to us, right by our chair. Our remote's right by our chair. We don't have to get up. If we could have a little pipe running over from the refrigerator with ice water, we wouldn't have to go get that. That's how easy we've made our lives. But David didn't have it that way in the wilderness, did he? He had somebody pursuing him constantly. King Saul. David didn't have time to relax in the wilderness. He didn't have time to get comfortable. He was on the run constantly. Maybe that's what God wants us to be, on the run, away from the sinful things out there and not get so comfortable with them. Maybe we need to get away from that stuff. So, and you know what? I don't know how to tell you. If we've allowed this stuff in our homes already, how do we get it out? I mean, we've gone so far now. Well, we've gone this far. Well, you know, we already accepted it. We just say, okay, let's start cleaning up. It's time to clean our homes. It's time to clean our church. Let's get back to the way God wants us to live and get rid of the wilderness spilt that's come into our home. You know, God explained the danger to us about this stuff. And He told us how we can control ourselves how we can avoid having this filth come into our homes and into our minds. And the verse, I'm, I'm going to use this verse tomorrow in my sermon also. It's found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Two of the best verses, if you want to memorize two verses, you should memorize these two. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But then he tells us how to fight these things. He says, and be not conformed to this world. The world that we're fighting, the world that we're living in out there, do not be conformed to that world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what he told David, and that's how David lived his life. He put himself and his 600 men in the trust of God and said, send us where you want to send us. We'll go and you protect us. Now I want to ask you something. Do you thank God for the protection that He gives to you? Do you stop and think of all the things that could have happened to you in your daily life? Do you stop and say, thank you, Lord, for keeping me safe today? Thank you for sending my children back home to me so that we can be a family this evening. Thank you for protecting my in-laws and my relatives and everyone else that you watched over. Did David thank God for what he did? Let's see how many times David thanked him here in this, this chapter alone. If you'll turn back and look at the very second verse of chapter 23, it says, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, 
Move down to fourth verse. It says, Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And then in the tenth verse, we find David talking to the Lord again. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeking. He said, Lord, I'm coming again to talk to you. Three times in this chapter alone, David has prayed to God and thanked him. Communicated with God. We've got to remember to do that when he watches over us, when he keeps us safe, when he shows us that he loves us. It doesn't hurt to bow down from time to time and thank God. So we see that David was put in a wilderness area, and we're in the same kind of wilderness. But it says he gave him strongholds. David had strongholds in that wilderness. The Greek word for stronghold is okchuroma. I probably said that wrong. It's O-C-H-U-R-O-M-A, okchuroma, and it means a fortress area. A fortress area, stronghold, something that's invincible. Now, I'm sure it wasn't a big walled city that David would have liked to have where nobody could get through. I believe in this particular instance it was the caves that were there. The hiding places that God prepared for David and 600 men to hide into and Saul walk right by him. Maybe even this far away from him. Walk right by and never know that David was there. God provided those strongholds in this wilderness for David. Now you ask yourself, do we have a stronghold today? I say we do. If you want to turn to me with me to Matthew chapter 16, I want to show you a verse. And I'm going to explain to you what our stronghold is. In fact, Jesus is going to do it better than I can. He's going to tell you here in verse 18. He says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My church. You want to talk about a stronghold in our wilderness today? Our church. That's our stronghold. That's what God has given us to come to tonight. A stronghold. Much nicer than what David had, but every bit as good. We are protected in this church. Because we're a child of God. Because we desire to seek out to come and hear the word, to come fellowship together tonight. We came to the right place because there's nothing that can happen to us in this church. You say, well, that's not true. Well, I, if something falls on this church and destroys us all, if we're saved individuals, where are we going? We're going home to be with the Lord. You can't ask for having a better place. And if we stay another day, right now we get to fellowship and feed on God's Word. You can't ask for a better place. You know, I also am so thankful that when Christ said that, He said, I will build my church. He didn't say, Peter, I'm building your church. He said, my church. Jesus' church. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are the bride. We are waiting for him to come back. And our job is to save the people that are out there and tell them about Christ. To get them in so they can accept the Lord. That's our job. But it doesn't stop there. We have to love one another as brothers and sisters. We have to work together for one common goal. You know, it seems that God's children don't seem to desire to gather themselves together anymore. Yeah. That seems to be a thing of the past. You know, the Bible says assembling themselves together is... Man. That is a commandment of God. It didn't say, if you feel like showing up on Sunday morning, 
my church door will be open and you can come in. He said, not forsaking the assembly. He says, do not pass it up. Amen. I thought about that. I thought about David here. <clears throat> you know, it doesn't take very long to starve in the wilderness. Yeah. Especially if you don't know how to hunt for food. Where David was, there probably was, it was a desolate area. That's what the definition of that was. Wilderness. Probably wasn't a lot of food just laying around, was there? It wouldn't take long for him and his men to die of physical food from not having any. It wouldn't take us long to die without our spiritual food. Same, <coughs> same thing applies to us when it comes to feasting on God's Word. But it seems that some people are on a crash diet. A spiritual crash diet because they don't need the Word of God to feed them anymore. They don't need it anymore. I say He's given us His stronghold and He wants us to feed on that Word. The wilderness is no place to be without a stronghold. We can't survive out this door a whole week without making a mistake, can we? It's not long before we go out of here and we've done something that we've, we've upset God over. We need to come back here to gather ourselves together. We need to support one another. You know what's one of the hardest things in the world is to tell each other our faults, Amen. our sins, our mistakes. The Bible says that we should confess our faults one to another. I'm supposed to lean on you, and I know I'm a heavy guy, but you, you're supposed to hold me up. You're supposed to lean on me, and I'm supposed to hold you up. That's what the Bible tells us. We're not going to survive without making mistakes. It's as simple as that. Amen. But we have to correct the mistakes when we make them. We need to cherish our churches. Amen. We need to hold them up to the Lord. And when I tell you that, I want you to just think of something here. There are no big men and there are no small churches. There are no big men and there are no small ministries. Every person is important to this church. Amen. No, I'm no more important standing up here preaching God's word than whoever cleans the windows of this church. We are equally as important in God's word. There are no small churches, brothers and sisters. Now I want you to think about that one. Because I know a lot of us, including myself, have been guilty I'm saying, oh, Liberty Baptist, well, they're not very big. There's only a handful of people showing up at Liberty. Even some people have said, well, why don't we just, why don't we just close the doors? There's only four or five people. In God's eyes, there's no small churches. God doesn't care how many people show up. He just cares that you do. God doesn't care what quantity we have but what quality Amen. we have. Amen. He doesn't care if there's 200 people here or 20 people here or two people here. But he matters. it matters to him how we conduct ourselves while we're here as a Christian. He wants quality, not quantity. Amen. From now on, I want to I change our way of thinking starting tonight. When everybody asks us, how's your church over there? I want us to start saying, we have a great church. Amen. We don't have a small church. We have a great church. We may be small in number, but you can help us out by coming over. You can come over and make us a bigger church, but we have a great church. We don't have a small church anymore. You know, Jesus is the husband, the church is the bride. The church is loved by Jesus and He cares about us. 
and we should show him that we care about him. From now on, we tell everybody we're a great church. He gave David strongholds for special reason to keep him safe, and he gave us a church to keep us safe. And we need to love our church and build our church and care about our church. Remember today, starting today, we are a great church.